Good morning. Good morning, everyone. And um, welcome to the United States Institute of Peace. Um, and welcome to this meeting of the Haiti Working Group. Uh, this meeting will conclude our sixth year of providing public forums uh, in Washington, D.C. on issues related to events in Haiti and uh, U.S.-Haitian relations. Today, we are going to discuss the courageous role that Haitian women have played in the aftermath of the, of the earthquake that occurred in January 2010, process of reconstructing Haiti, which has gone on since then. We have a group of distinguished speakers this morning, but before we get to our program, I want to first thank a number of organizations that have contributed to this program. First, I want to thank my colleague, uh, Kathleen Kunitz, the director of the Center for Gender and Peacebuilding at USIP, which along with the Haiti program is a co-sponsor of this event. And I think I forgot the most important thing, which is to introduce myself. My name is Bob Perito, and I direct the Haiti program here at USIP. Uh, second, I want to thank uh, Elise Nelson, who is president and CEO of Vital Voices for Global Partnership. Vital Voices calls attention to extraordinary women around the world. And consistent with its mission, Vital Voices is responsible for bringing to Washington this morning a group of dynamic Haitian women who are with us, and they're here in the front row. This morning, we will hear from Danielle Saint-Laurent, Minister, former Minister of Commerce, Industry, and Tourism in Haiti. Um, but I also want to welcome her colleague, uh, Senator Edmond Bozil, who is, I understand, the only woman, woman now serving in the Senate of Haiti. Third, um, I would like to thank someone who's not here this morning, unfortunately, and that's the actress Maria Bello. Most of us know her, if we watch TV, as the star of a program called Prime Suspect, but Maria Bello is also a co-founder of the organization We Advance, an organization dedicated to promoting the health, safety, and well-being of women in Haiti. She was a motivating force behind the effort to bring our delegation of Haitian women to Washington. And I would like to welcome in this regard Barbel Guillon, who is a co-founder of We Advance, and Adele Frischman, who is the organization's executive director, and they're with us in the front row this morning. And finally, I want to thank Digital Democracy, an organization that uses technology to employ or to empower marginalized communities around the world. Digital Democracy has received funding from USIP, from our Haiti project, uh, to instruct women in Haiti on the use of technology to prevent violence in their communities. And I want to thank Emily Jacoby, who is a co-founder and executive director of Digital Democracy, for the beautiful photographs that you saw in the atrium uh, as you were coming in, and for the slideshow, which you uh, saw running here as you were seated. The photographs in the slideshow were photographs of Digital Democracy's training program for women in Haiti. The photographs that were in the atrium were taken by Haitian women. And the, um, as I understand it, the, the names of all of those photographs, the titles, all came from the women themselves. So, we have a very full program this morning, as you can see from our agenda. So I'd like to get started. Um, you have a handout on the biographies of all of our speakers. So, in the interest of time, we'll save time by uh, making only really very short introductions. And so, uh, first we'd like to begin. I'd like to introduce Kathleen Kunitz, the Director of the Gender and Peacebuilding Center at USIP. Kathleen has a long and extremely distinguished history of service at international organizations like the World Bank um, concerned with issues related to women in development. Um, and I'd like to invite her to take the podium and to introduce our topic this morning. Kathleen. Thank you very much. Thanks for your thoughtful introduction, Bob, and I too want to express my appreciation to the Haitian delegation and to acknowledge your efforts uh, to be a part of this event today. Thank you for your voices uh, to help us all on the way forward together. As Bob has noted, USIP has worked diligently over the years to maintain a focus on Haiti. 
Eight months after the earthquake, our centers co-hosted an event to highlight the urgent security needs as a result of the reports of rampant sexual and gender-based violence in the camps. The chilling reports of women, girls, and babies being raped by gangs of young men and older boys left us feeling hopeless without power. But a year later, we are here today to expand our focus on women, not only as victims of violence, for this we understand they are the majority, but also to highlight and acknowledge the ways in which Haitian women are making change happen at both the grass level, uh, level in the camps, as well as in leadership roles in civil society and government. We embrace the assessment made by former Chilean president and now head of UN Women, Michelle Bachelet, during her visit to Haiti in February 2010 that Haiti's reconstruction will be faster if women are an intricate part of the process. We know that life in Haiti was devastating for a vast majority before the earthquake struck. We know that an estimated 80% of the Haitians lived in extreme poverty, and more than half suffered from malnutrition. Unemployment was a staggering 70%, and tens of thousands of people died each year from preventable illnesses, especially because of the lack of clean water. Average life expectancy was only 50 years, and one in 16 women faced a lifetime of dying during childbirth. Today, nearly 700 days after the earthquake, we are looking into the face of our own global future yet realized with potential climatic changes like what has occurred in Haiti that turns a city, a country into a living nightmare overnight. The international community needs to continue a serious process of self-reflection we must keep learning from our best practices and our worst mistakes. We know moving forward that holistic approaches to relief and sustainable reconstruction requires more than half the population. It requires a resilient effort that ensures that women are an integral part of the problem solving and decision making. At USIP, we're very committed to conflict prevention and to assist in developing alternative strategies to resolving conflicts by nonviolent means. Therefore, today we ask several questions to focus our efforts here. What can be done to prevent the violent and systematic use of sexual and gender-based violence in Haiti today? And how can we better assure that women are playing key roles in bringing innovative approaches to, and putting an end to the violence and preventing future violence in generations to come. I am heartened and at moments even dismayed by the number of international commitments and mechanisms that we in Washington and New York work on every day to ensure that places and countries like Haiti gets the support so that they can help raise themselves. We have many policy tools in our toolbox. Just to name a few, we have the UN Security Council Resolution 1325, which seeks increased representation of women at decision-making levels in national, regional, and international institutions for the prevention, management, and resolution of conflict. We have Security Council Resolution 1820, which seeks through consultation with women and women-led organizations to develop effective mechanisms for providing protection and security from violence for women and girls in refugee and internally displaced persons camp especially protection from sexual violence. 
We have, internationally speaking, CEDA, or the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. The Beijing Platform for Action. Um, we have the Inter-American Convention on the Prevention, Punishment, and Eradication of Violence Against Women. We have the Millennium Development Goals, including Goal 3, to promote gender equality, to empower women and girls. And we have, most importantly, qualified Haitian women and Haitian women's organizations that must be a part of all of these international policies, deliberations, and decision-making processes in the economic and political recovery of Haiti. So now we must move from all of these aspirations to actions. As our own Secretary of State, Hillary Rodham Clinton, has emphasized, the problems we face today are too big, too complex to be solved without the full participation of women. And so, as we've turned this morning to focusing on a country in our backyard, as I continually say, if we can't get it right in Haiti, where are we going to get it right? And so today is a part of bringing this focus on Haitian women, looking at the roles that they are playing, innovative efforts to bring more imagination and reality to a life without violence and to a life that embraces hope and a generation to come. I want to now turn the podium back to Bob, who will introduce our first speaker. Thank you. It's my very great pleasure now to introduce uh, Michelle Montaz. Uh, this, is a, this is a difficult task. Um, looking over this extraordinarily distinguished resume, it's hard to pick out things to emphasize. Uh, but I will try to do my best uh, just to name a few of her achievements. Uh, first of all, she is an award-winning Haitian journalist. And there is a long, long list of awards from organizations around the world for her distinguished work as a broadcast journalist. Uh, and then there is her service that most of us are familiar with um, as the spokesperson and senior communications advisor to the Secretary General of the United Nations from 2007 to 2009, and the fact that she played that role for the President of the United Nations General Assembly in the years before that. But um, also, uh, there is the serious work that she's done in the last year as a special advisor to the senior, um, to the SRSG, the special representative of the Secretary General at the UN mission in, in Haiti and Port-au-Prince. So I would like to invite <coughs> Michelle to join us at the podium. We are very grateful that you're here this morning. It's a great honor for us here at USIP to have you. I would like uh, first to thank uh, USIP and uh, Robert Perito uh, for associating me to this event on Haiti's reconstruction and the role of women. Thank you, Bob, for your introduction. Uh, Dr. Kathleen Kernis framed our topics in the larger UN and international framework, so I leave that part of it to our discussion later on. We, have, we are privileged to have in this room people who, since the quake, have worked in the camps of the displaced, have participated in the relief efforts here in Washington or in Haiti, or are members of Haiti's very vibrant women organizations. I hope we'll get a chance to share their experiences and perspective this morning. In 44 days, we'll mark the second anniversary of the quake that killed more than 200,000 of the people we loved, that destroyed countless schools, hospitals, churches, bridges, and roads that deeply maimed each one of us and that will profoundly scar Haiti for years to come. The quake and its aftershocks, there was still one last Sunday in Petit Guave, have brought together in the 10 cities of Port-au-Prince, Léogane, Petit Guave, or Jacmel, not only the victims of those 35 apocalyptic minutes, but also the slum dwellers of our capital cities 
who have come to find in the camps the basic services they were denied for decades. Today, the number of people living in tent cities is down from a million and a half to around 600,000. Half of them are women and girls. If the numbers have gone down, it's not because the needs are being met. In fact, more and more international NGOs who used to provide basic services, water distribution, sanitation, or health clinics to the camps are now packing up and leaving because Haiti has stopped being a priority or because there is not enough funding to sustain the humanitarian effort. On the international level, of the $300 million dollar consolidated appeal the United Nations system requested to cover humanitarian needs, only 52% has been funded. If the numbers in the 10 cities have gone down, it is also because landowners and mayors have been legally and illegally evicting residents, or because the residents themselves give up hope that aid might reach them. Many have settled for other makeshift solutions, patching up so-called yellow shacks in their old neighborhoods, which means getting back to the status quo ante and rebuilding homes that will inevitably collapse again. I returned to Haiti in January 2010, a week before the earthquake struck. And I was there until last June, a special advisor to the head of the United Nations mission in Haiti, as Bob mentioned, for 18 months, dealing with first the emergency aid and rescue operations, then the humanitarian assistance to the camps and displaced communities, and the rebuilding of temporary schools, clinics, and government offices, I became, as a Haitian, increasingly aware that the earthquake has essentially exacerbated a reality that has plagued Haiti for decades, the exclusion of its majority, the poor, the peasants, women. What role can Haitian women who represent 52% of our population play? What role have they played since the tragedy? How can the tremendous energy and resilience that have, they have shown since the earthquake be harnessed for a different future? And what has become of the sense of urgency felt in the reconstruction efforts 18 months ago. What has become of the sense that we should and we could as a nation and as a society seize the time and the terrible opportunities of that quake to finally make the changes we had dreamed of collectively 25 years ago. We were then talking of drastically reforming the state structure, changer l'état. And during that Haitian spring of 1986-87 of building a less unjust society, for a short period after the quake, the incredible outpour of solidarity from individuals or from government the world over seemed to create the condition for us to rebuild better, rebuild our destroyed infrastructure, but also rebuild a more inclusive nation. Before I came here, I reviewed a number of articles from the international media about Haitian women. Most were written after the quake. Most convey the image of the Haitian woman as victim they overwhelmingly cover violence against women and girls in the 10 cities with statistics to prove the point. The World Bank indeed estimates that 70% of Haitian women have been affected by some form of violence, a great deal of it being domestic violence. Before discussing the role of women in rebuilding Haiti, I feel we should first address the issue of violence and the image of Haitian women as passive victims. The issue is real. Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International have recently released excellent investigating report, investigation reports of violence in the major tent cities in Port-au-Prince. Reporting sexual and gender-based violence remains problematic in Haiti, according to Amnesty International. The lack of an appropriate and secure place to make a complaint, the lack of trust in the police and judicial system are major obstacles to reporting in a society where the social stigma associated with sexual violence makes it difficult for women and girls to report or seek medical help. Fear of reprisal attacks is also a major obstacle to reporting, especially as women and girls have no option but to remain in the same inadequate shelters in the same camp where they were attacked and to lodge complaints in the streets where they could be seen or overheard speaking to the police. 
the limited prevention and response mechanism that existed before January 2010 have been further undermined by the earthquake. The Ministry of Women's Affairs and Women's Rights was destroyed, seriously reducing its ability to develop an adequate response to initial reports of sexual and gender-based violence after the quake. Three influential leaders of women's advocacy groups who had won a major battle in 2005 in obtaining that rape be punished as a crime and who systematically pursued cases of violence against women in the court system were killed. On January 12, 2010, police stations and courthouses were destroyed or severely damaged, making it more difficult for survivors to report sexual and gender-based violence. In Port-au-Prince, for example, the earthquake completely flattened Four National Police Station, where there was a special unit of police officers trained to respond to victims of sexual violence. This pilot project was the first of its kind in Haiti, notes Amnesty International. If violence against women in Haiti is a major issue, it is only one of the many challenges women face. And portraying Haitian women as helpless victims ignores the work being done by women organizations and the survivors themselves to put an end to that violence. Two grassroots organizations, the Commission of Women Victims for Victims, COFAVIV, and Women Victims Arise, FAVILEC, are won by survivors of sexual violence. They are the main contact point for many women living in the camps. One of their key objectives is to ensure access to justice and reparations for the survivors, a daunting task, considering the difficult access to a largely dysfunctional judicial system and a very lengthy and ineffective legal process that prevail. Women and girls in post-earthquake Haiti face additional challenges, lack of access to family planning, prenatal and obstetric care, a need to engage in survival sex to buy food for themselves and their children, and sexual violence. The crisis is reflected in pregnancy rates in displaced person camps that are three times higher than in urban areas before the earthquake, and rates of maternal mortality that rank among the world's worst. The situation is not entirely new. Women and girls in Haiti died during pregnancy and childbirth at alarming high rates even before the quake. One in 16 women faced the risk of dying during childbirth. Uh, Kathleen mentioned uh, that statistic. They also faced crushing poverty and a stark disparity in access to education compared to men. Almost 60% of women cannot read or write. Many can count though. And here we touch upon a non-gender specific issue, the gap that exists between urban and rural Haiti. That gap is worse for women, nearly 25% of the women in urban areas have finished secondary school compared with less than 2% in rural areas. These numbers should be seen in a larger context. The average life expectancy in Haiti is only 50 years and more than half of all Haitians depend on agriculture for their livelihood, with women providing most of the labor for subsistence agriculture. Poor policies have made Haiti dependent on importing half of all its food, the highest percentage in this hemisphere. Here also, the richest 1% of the population control nearly half of the country's wealth, something that should not surprise my friends of the Occupy Wall Street movement. A coalition gender shadow report of the 2010 Haiti post-disaster needs assessment issued by a group of women association, among them Equality Now, underlines a more crucial fact that the earthquake served to exacerbate existing inequalities, rendering it not just a natural disaster, but also an example of massive injustice. Years of systemic gender discrimination have exposed the women of Haiti to higher rates of poverty and violence, and the disaster too has proved anything but neutral, the report says. In spite of the dismal statistics in health or education, in spite of worrying economic indicators, in spite of these reports and articles describing Haitian women as victims or passive aid recipients, the reality I know is quite different. It is that of strong, resilient women who in spite of stubborn inequalities have developed amazing survival skills 
and who want to be key players. If we are to rebuild a different Haiti, it cannot be done without the increasing empowerment of women, economically, politically. But so far, so far, the voices of women have to a large extent been excluded from the reconstruction process, even though women are such a vital part of the country's economy. Uh, Bob, I don't know how much time I have. Five, okay. Uh, almost two years after the quake, real drug creation has not meaningfully replaced the cash or food for work programs quickly conceived as a band-aid after the quake. Last year, this program supported by the United Nations Development Program, the World Food Program, the UN Mission in Haiti, MINUSTA, employed more than 300,000 people, of which 40% were women. Similar temporary jobs were created by other programs like those of USAID or the Haitian government. Nearly 50% of Haitian women are economically active, a record number in our hemisphere. Even though women manage 42% of households and make up more than 75% of Haiti's informal economy, few women have access to credit, even though some banks have reached out to the informal sector. Small microcredit programs are available to rural women. Two lending organizations that some of you might know, the Lambie Fund of Haiti and Foncosé, among others, have been providing such microcredit funds. The Lambie Fund is supporting sustainable agriculture programs to meet growing demand for locally produced food and funding small ventures, many run by women, such as fish farms, sugarcane mills, and goat and pig breeding projects. Fondation Colesépol Foncosé is Haiti's largest microfinance institution with more than 55,000 borrowers, most of them women, who live and work in the countryside of Haiti and more than 255,000 savers. The political empowerment of women and their increasing participation in all matters concerning Haiti has since the quake met some setback. Prime Minister Kony, in his inauguration speech, acknowledged that only 0.7% of women hold a decisional position in spite of their demographic weight. The rumors of the elimination of the Ministry of Women Affairs by the new government after the presidential election created an uproar in port prince as women would not accept to give up the hard-won access to one form of political participation. It turned out to be false, and the ministry still stands. In the Haitian Senate, we have one woman out of the full membership of 30 senators. She's with us today, Senator Bozil, and she's also head of a political party, Fusion. I'm also sure that Daniel saint who has worked uh, for many years in the political empowerment of women, will address the issue this morning, so I won't uh, speak too much about it. I will simply say that in May 2011, the 49th legislature approved the proposed amendment of the 1987 constitution of a minimum quota of 30% of women in the Haitian legislature. It will remain wishful thinking if political empowerment does not reach the local and community level, and if women candidates do not receive adequate support. In comparison, in Rwanda, the 2003 constitution requires that at least 30% of parliamentary and cabinet seats go to women. And today, 56% of parliamentarians in that country are women. Beyond holding electoral positions, one key issue is increasing women's voices, certainly in political processes, but also more broadly at the community level and in civil society and professional organizations. Haiti already has many strong, vibrant women's organizations that can lead the way. Following Haiti's devastating earthquake, Haiti's government, supported by the World Bank, led an ambitious post-disaster needs assessment, an operative blueprint for reconstruction. It exposed the significant cracks in Haiti's economy, infrastructure, governance system, environment, and social services, and offered detailed, helpful recommendations on how to rebuild and even improve such systems. Still, critical voices were noticeably absent from this assessment and its resulting reconstruction framework, those of Haitian civil society, and especially the voices of women. Comprised of eight themes in total, the PDNA only addresses gender explicitly in one theme, that of cross-cutting 
issues. We, uh, I will, of course, <laughs> speak a little more later uh, if, uh, if you are interested uh, about the project that we did, uh, The Voice of the Voiceless, where we actually went to the countryside to listen to women's voices and what they said. They wanted more participations. They wanted to have a say in their own affairs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my next task here is to introduce somebody who really doesn't need to be introduced to this group. If you've been coming to um, Haiti working group meetings over the years, you've already met Bob McGuire, who is the chairman of our Haiti working group, uh, and he has a day job in real life. He's the professor of the practice of international affairs at George Washington University. Um, I understand that um, Bob also teaches at the Foreign Service Institute, and we have in our audience a group of U.S. diplomats who are in training to go to Haiti. And as a former U.S. diplomat myself, um, we're, it's very good to have you here with us this morning. I'd like to invite Bob to come up and take the podium. Bonjour tout le monde. Let me try something. As Bob mentioned, my students are here from the FSI. On air. Ah, good, good. I'm teaching them that, yes. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be here today and to be among a group of distinguished women. It reminds me a little bit of uh, my meandering career of having spent 10 years at Trinity Washington University in Northeast DC, which is an entirely women's college. In fact, as I'm the only male on the podium here, it reminds me of sometimes at Trinity when to participate in certain events, I was designated as an honorary woman. <laughs> it was very different. <laughs> I enjoyed the experiences. Um, I, I'm struck by some of Michelle's comments, just make one or two of my own. Um, one of my proudest moments as someone who's worked a lot on Haiti was when I was able to serve as the expert witness in a civil trial in New York City where three uh, women, identified as Jane Doe 1, 2, and 3 Haitian women, um, launched a suit against a man named Emmanuel Constant, uh, better known as Toto Constant, the founder uh, and leader of an organization called FRAP. That's FRAP. And in this uh, trial, which was held in New York under several very interesting US laws, um, I was serving as the, um, the witness for the women, um, trying to demonstrate that Mr. Constant uh, should be punished because of his role as the founder and leader of this organization. It was a great honor for me to do that. The case was won by the women. Um, the judge awarded them $19 million in damage, which unfortunately they will probably never collect, but they had the satisfaction of having justice served. Um, what struck me as very interesting was that in the succeeding days, when news of this event reached Port-au-Prince, it was reported that many women went into the street and demonstrated for similar functions of justice to occur in Port-au-Prince. The Minister of Women's Affairs responded by lamenting that we would like to help, but we do not have the resources to do that. And as we know from what Michelle also said, the judicial system does not function very strongly in this matter. But that's what I'm reminded of. But I'm also reminded of something else. As Michelle mentioned, phone calls um, and the Lambi Fund. I'm reminded of my earlier work with the Inter-American Foundation in supporting women and their quest to bring themselves up by their bootstraps. One of my earlier um, experiences in that was um, representing or, or helping an organization called FAF. And this was in the early 1980s. I think FAF is actually still around. It was an organization founded by a group of women, Haitian, Haitian women bankers. And many of them went on to serve in ministerial posts in, in subsequent government. But their mission was to assist market women to better manage their businesses. 
And in Haiti, of course, women are also known as the poto miton, the center post. That's the weight-bearing post. It's also the post from which the spirits descend to give people strength and energy. And the women that Faf were working with, these market women, were truly poto miton of Haitian society. Let me introduce our next two speakers, and um, then I'll join my colleagues here on the podium. We will hear in succession from Danielle St. Lo, who is an associate and CEO of Caribbean Business Consulting, which is a firm that promotes business development and investments in Haiti at the local level in competitive value chains. As has been mentioned earlier, she was a Minister of Commerce, Industry, and Tourism in Haiti, and she's been the Executive Director of the Chamber of Commerce and Industry in Haiti. She's worked extensively, believe me, in private sector development, local governance, civic education, and women's political and economic empowerment. She is co-founder and president of Femme en Democratie, a Haitian nonprofit organization that is affiliated with the Vital Voices Partnership. And she is also a member of the Vital Voices International Consultative Board. Danielle will be followed by Emily Jacoby, who is the co-founder and executive director of Digital Democracy, a New York-based nonprofit that works globally to empower marginalized populations with digital tools. She has worked with marginalized communities, including migrant workers, women's group, refugee youth, and others in media and technology projects in Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, and the United States. Before she founded Digital Democracy in 2008, she worked as a journalist with news network allafrica.com and Y Press. And today, the USIP and Digital Democracy have teamed up to train women activists in Haiti to monitor and report violence in their communities, especially by using cell phones and other forms of information technology to prevent conflict. So Danielle, would you like to take my place up here? Honor, respect. Honor, respect. Okay. I would like to thank the US Institute of Peace, Vital Voices Global Partnership. We advance, and particularly my actress Maria Bello, for associating us to this prestigious event. The theme of this event is the Haiti reconstruction process. As Asian women, we really want to talk about nation building. That's what we are looking for. Throughout the history of Haiti, women have played an important role in shaping the country. From the creation of the Asian flag to campaign for the right to vote, labor rights, poor economic policy, and the fight to end dictatorships, Asian women have successfully fought for equality and a just society. I'm not going to talk about all Michelle was saying, and I have to remove two pages from my presentation because she has said everything about the whole situation and also the challenges. Today, nearly two years after the January 12th earthquake, Asian women voices have not so far been heard in the discussion for the reconstruction of Haiti. Asian women have been silent. They have been silent, but very active, with limited resources, carrying out criti critical activities in underserved, disaster-affected communities, including reuniting families, conducting needs assessment, documenting rape cases, and chan channeling psychosocial and material support to vulnerable women and girls in devastated neighborhoods and camps. We have been silent. We are still silent, but busy under our tents in camps and our tent office with goats and chickens, 
doing our best to get back on our feet. We have been too busy burying our death, supporting survivors, worrying about our traumatized children, our people under tents in rainy and hurricane seasons. We are busy living on a survival mode. Most earthquake victims are still living in tents or iris damaged houses. I'm well dressed. I'm still in a broken house. Women are the greatest victims and are disproportionately affected by increased gender-based violence. By all indicators, even before the earthquake, Asian women were extremely vulnerable. A large number of Asian families of female-headed households with limited social safety nets or government protective services. While humanitarian relief initiative or targeting immediate basic needs, few reconstruction efforts are targeting long-term livelihood development. We are busy trying to resume businesses' operations. We have been so busy that we have not taken the time to cry and start the healing process. How can we talk about reconstruction if our minds, our souls, are still under rubbles? We, women living in devastated Paul Prince, Jacques Mel, Leogan, are still broken, too vulnerable to be fully part of the so-called reconstruction process. Throughout the country, there are thousands of women organizations, groups, and capable women leaders working in the shadow to address women's and communities' issues and advocating for gender equality, social, and economic justice. They are also in the diaspora, working hard to provide a better life to their family and community in Haiti. These women, out of power press and abroad, mostly in the US, are our strength. They are the backbone of our economy, of our country. They should be the potomitan, as Bob was saying, the center pillar of the building of our nation on sound foundation. While doing our best to take some time to try and start our healing process, we should rely on these women to think and plan the new Haiti. Many of them are illiterate, but very knowledgeable of the needs and priorities of their community. They understand what social capital is. With limited resources, they are the default suppliers of many of the social protections and services that should normally be granted by the state. Others, more educated, are in key position as health agents, consultants, managers, planners, and programs coordinators for most international and local NGOs providing services to the population. Now it is important that these women be supported so that they can enhance their skills and confidence to integrate the business and public sector so that they can better join forces to claim their rights and space in the reconstruction debates. They should stop acting in the shadow and have their voice heard at all levels and tables of what we should not be called reconstruction process, but nation building effort. Through a public-private partnership, Farm and Democracy has joined forces with other network and federation of women organization in bringing together women's association from throughout the country, including all municipalities and rural communities, to launch a concerted effort to support women full participation in the nation building process. This initiative is 
under the leadership of the Ministry of Women Affairs and the caucus of Asian women parliamentarians is articulated in the slogan, Femme, c'est Potomitan au construction Haiti. Women of the Potomitan of the construction of Haiti. It is financed by the Norway government and supported by the minister. And we are really proud and happy to have our new Minister of Women Affairs. She's a strong businesswoman, running the largest business support association of Haiti, 12,000 micro and small entrepreneurs. And I can tell you that's what we are dreaming, leaving the private sector, leaving the NGO to enter the public sector to make change. Through the, this initiative, a process of consultation has been initiated at the national level through the convening of 350 focus groups that are bringing together over 5,000 women. These focus groups are carried out in November and December this year throughout the country in over 100 municipalities and rural communities. They will facilitate a dialogue around women's concerns and priorities and concrete action that must be taken to address them. In the month of January and February of 2012, the result of this focus group will feed discussion and facilitate setting of women key priorities in a regional forum organized in the 10th geographic departments. This regional forum will conduct to a national discussion in March 2012, bringing together about 40 delegates representing all departments. Result from the local and regional consultation will facilitate the drafting of key elements of Asian Women Platform for Action for National Building. With this earthquake, we have realized we are not by ourselves on our small island with the deer, that there is a world, and we have to take account that we are living in a global world. So that's why to better refine the platform and extend consultation, the Ministry of Women Affairs and the Caucus of Asian Women Parliamentarians will convene women leaders from countries who have experienced challenging conflicts and who have achieved peace and overseen difficult process of reconstruction. These leaders from countries such as Rwanda, Northern Ireland, Guatemala, Benin, and Liberia will share their experiences, including best practice and lesson learned with Asian women leaders. This exercise linking the local to the global will facilitate the refinement and adoption of a national women platform for action with 10 key points that will serve as a compass for the participation of Asian women in the national building process. This platform will be translated into a legislative agenda by the caucus of Asian women parliamentarians. It will also serve as an advocacy tool in favor of a national budget that adequately responds to the needs of Asian women and those of their communities. This initiative is supported by international women leaders and celebrities like Maria Bello and by the organization Vital Voices Global Partnership. It extends beyond Haiti's borders and is becoming a global movement in favor of Haitian women full participation in the national, in the national building process. We're inviting you to join this movement. Today, 22 months after the January 12th earthquake, there is a new disposition towards change. President Michel Martelly, a singer with no political background, has been elected with 67 of votes because of this new claim for change. Building the country is an enormous challenge which requires transformational leadership. The building of our nation is not about buildings, 
construction code. Projects are money. It's about vision, unity of purpose, and power to plan and control what the future Haiti will be and serve. Only women can be drivers of change and of this unity of purpose for the renaissance of Haiti. It's time to have the voices of women on the ground heard and identify concrete strategies and ways to tap into their resourcefulness to address community needs throughout the nation building process. We women leaders from the NGO cannot be their voices. Their true voices either is their elected representative in local governments and parliament. Their true voice is Senator Edmond Bozil. Stand up, Edmond. <laughs> I am proud, I'm really proud to introduce to the audience Senator Bozil, the first Asian woman democratically elected as president of a political party. She's not the daughter, she's not the wife, she's not the, of a political leader. She's herself a strong leader. And she's paving the way for many, many more women. The true voice of Haiti, of Haitian, of Haitian women, is the Haitian Women Parliamentarian Caucus, which needs the full support of the US Institute of Peace, of Vital Voices, of Digital Democracy, and other US public and private institutions involved or interested in Haiti. The true voice is this caucus, which will be reinforced by capable women from different departments running for senatorial election next spring. Their true voice will be women such as Barbara Guillaume, Barbara Stanop, who is also in this room. <laughs> running for mayor, next local election for the most challenging neighborhood of Haiti, Cité Soleil. She will win. <laughs> this woman, this woman candidate for Senate and mayor will be one voice. They will campaign under the Women National Platform for Action or for National Building. The investiture of more women in Senate and a critical mass of women in local government will allow the women to collectively question the rules of the political game, to set new rules and more transparent procedures, to influence legislative and local agendas in favor of social and economic transformation responsive to women's children and community needs. People needs at urban and rural level will be addressed with more women in public decision-making position. Women equal participation in public life will not only facilitate women direct engagement in public decision-making, but ensure that the needs of all segments of the population are taken into account through the implementation of equitable and just policies through the nation building. This is not a dream, a dream, it's a reality. And all of you in, the, in this room should participate to this initiative. Being elected in Haiti, it's a big, big challenge. And these women, I know the challenge that they're, that they're going to face. We have been supporting women candidates for the last two elections. It's tough. Women tend to be less corrupted. We don't know any woman in Haiti running for candidate that has been supported by drug money. We know until it's proof that many parliamentarians are were involved in drug and drug money had helped them being reelected. And we know that the US knows more about this than us because we are not really sophisticated in terms of you know, investigation and all those stuff. So we can't find again this money, but we have a strong diaspora. 
We have women all over the country. We have you NGOs working in Haiti, those going to Haiti soon. We will need not only your, we need your prayers, your moral support, but your money. <laughs> because this woman, if we want this country to change, and we have been talking to President Martelly about this, and he understands that we need change in the country, and we should be the agents. So those women should be elected. So we will be through digital, digital democracy working to reach you because we don't know how to use those things, those tools. They are too sophisticated for us. So they will help us. So we are counting on all of you. And also we are counting on you from the US Peace of Justice that are going to meet with Congress today and to talk about these efforts that the women of Haiti are doing. We will be meeting this afternoon with Senator Nelson, Senator Landry. So we, you, we need to bring the world that women has to be in net, in net Senate, in Parliament, and also in local governments. It is such an honor to follow you, Danielle, and to be here in this room. And um, I want to begin, of course, echoing uh, my fellow panelists by thanking USIP for their real vision and leadership and belief in Haitian women. It's, um, it's been really powerful to be in partnership with USIP over the past year, and it's really been an honor. Um, I want to begin with a story. Um, hopefully most of you got to see the photos that were outside taken by um, some of the Haitian women that I've been blessed enough to work with over the past year. And we first did a photo training um, in April 2010, so just a few months after the earthquake. And Digital Democracy had been doing other work in Haiti before the earthquake, um, but we really started working with women specifically in the spring, um, really in response to what has already been described, the lack of women's voices in the formal reconstruction process. And when we started the program, there were 13 women, and we started by asking them, how many of you have taken a picture before? Only two of them had ever taken a picture before, one of which only on their cell phone. So when you first encounter a new technology, it seems sophisticated, it seems difficult, you're not sure how to use it, um, but pretty quickly they learned, of course, and they were awesome. They took really powerful photos. Some of the photos that are out there, um, the one of the woman, the woman with the buckets around her, that was taken about five hours after that particular photographer had learned how to use a camera for the first time. It's a photo that's as strong as any that have come out of post-earthquake Haiti by the professional journalists who came down. And one of the things we did is we asked the women, you know, turn, starting to get them warmed up, we asked them, can you describe three, pick three words to describe Haitian women? And they went around. And almost all of the women we were working with um, are self-identified victims of sexual violence, um, either during political attacks before, or some of them had even been attacked in the camps, you know, post earthquake. But the, the words that they said, and this is echoing themes that have already been said, they were not words of passive victims. They were strong, they said strong, fierce, proud, able to survive many sufferings, mothers, leaders, and it was just so affirming to, to hear all of that. And I think that's really reflected in the photos that, again, show a level of intimacy and show the reality on the ground in a way that no outsider ever can, no matter how good their camera is, no matter how many times they've spent, uh, you know, no matter how many times they've spent time in camps and so on. It's really different when you see it actually from people who live in the community themselves. So, as I said, we know, we've been working with um, USIP um, over the past year, and it's really been such an honor. We, um, we first uh, had a partnership last fall where we worked with some of the women's groups that we'd been working with since the spring before that, and we looked at what, um, what was the prevalence of violence in their communities in the lead up to the um, elections. And we really focus on the ways that technology tools like mobile phones um, and also online reporting could enable them to tell the story of the reality that was happening in their camps. Um, 
one of the groups we work with that's already been mentioned, Kofa Viv, Commission of Women Victims for Victims, they actually, they were recording um, the incidents of rape and sexual assault all last year, and they continue to do that to this day. They recorded the highest number of rapes last year in the six weeks leading up to the election. I don't know if that's correlation, causation, you know, we could probably have a much longer conversation about that, but it's very real that as, you know, the political situation was heating up, when, when women were being incredibly targeted and their security really put them at risk. So when we talked about the elections and what that meant for them, they talked so much about fear of going to the polls, of leaving their children behind. Um, of what it would mean to actually wait in the polls all day, to not knowing where their polling station was. So there's some you know, very concrete challenges that women face just for the most basic level of political participation, which is voting itself. Um, one, of the, one of the impacts of that initial training was we found that they really had a lot they wanted to say. They had very um, specific and often diverse opinions about the political process, around what was happening in their lives, around violence in their community. And one of the um, unattended consequences was that they really wanted to have their voice heard beyond our initial project. And we started a blog, and it's called Femme Parler, which is Women Speak in Creole. Uh, the address is femmeparler.blogspot.com. Um, they started writing about their experiences and starting posting photos that they were taking. And some of the most incredible um, post-election coverage that I read actually came from the women we work with. Um, you know, their very real, raw experiences. There's a very powerful blog post that came up during the post-election violence period um, that one of, uh, one of the women talked about just how women, once again, were bearing the brunt of the violence that was happening in their community. The women we work with are grassroots women. They are mostly uneducated, um, you know, low levels of literacy. They are yet, despite that, incredible leaders in their community. Um, they provide services, psychosocial support. They provide medical and legal accompaniment to women who have been raped or assaulted. Um, and they also are really advocating for changes in their community. They're participating in various ways, organizing marches, um, organizing sit-ins. And the question we really asked ourselves along the process as we evolved from just working with photography was, okay, how are they using tools already? Because most of them do have mobile phones and they find ways to charge them. Um, how, can, how can we use the tools that they're already using to take their work up a notch? Um, the power of technology, you know, is many-fold, but it includes the power to amplify, the power to you know, reach more people, um, to make workflows more efficient, to, um, to actually digitize information and therefore be able to analyze it better. And so one of the first things um, after the blog was we started looking at cell phones and uh, started using, helping them use um, free open source tools like Frontline SMS, which allows you to send multiple text messages to people. So our partners started using Frontline SMS to actually organize and to reach more women and to arrange for meetings and to remind women when there were gonna be follow-up psychosocial, psychosocial support groups and so on. And then, one of the major issues that um, has really been a challenge, I think, when it's come to the question of violence against women in Haiti is a lack of fully representational data. And so we worked with, um, a, on a pilot project with Kofaviv uh, to take all the data that they've been recording and actually start to digitize it. So we built a digital database that's now become an information management system and really built their capacity to take the information they were already gathering about where victims um, had been attacked, about whether or not they were getting support, about kind of the nature of the incidents. And a lot of this information has now been used in all the international reports that have come out, you know, including um, the one from Human Rights Watch um, that is on the table outside. And this database process has been really incredible because we've seen how They've taken the information that they already had, but when it's all on paper and it's all separate, you know, you have all these ideas in your head, but you're not able to start seeing, you're not able to see the patterns. Well, digitizing the data, beginning to analyze it, creating graphs, beginning to share that with their domestic and international partners, they've been able to see trends. They've been able to figure out how to ask better questions um, and, and how to then better respond to the, the problems that they're seeing. 
One of the major issues is how many women who do get attacked and, um, and are experiencing violence, how little they know where to get support. Um, there are many clinics, there are many women's centers, but they don't always know where they are, how to get to them. So another um, project that's come uh, through our work that was really requested by our partners and we worked with them to build is the first um, free rape response hotline in the country. The number is 572. It's a free code provided by the two major mobile providers, uh, Digicel and Voila. And any woman can call 572 and say you know, what has happened to her and get um, connected to the nearest medical um, support that she can get. They chose the number 572 because they really wanted to highlight 72 hours. 72 hours, um, if a woman who has been attacked is able to seek medical help within those 72 hours, it can really be preventative, help prevent um, transmission of sexually transmitted diseases, help prevent um, preg unwanted pregnancy, um, and really get her the medical support she needs if she does choose to pursue legal justice and so on. That call center was launched um, this uh, August by our partner Kofa Viv, um, and it uh, started off by they were just sharing it um, amongst their partners and within a trusted network. And as they've worked through what it's like to really be answering these calls and so on, the past few weeks they've gone on national radio <coughs> and television to really broadcast the call center, and they've had a huge spike in the number of calls. Many of them are just people who are seeking information. They haven't necessarily been attacked or attacked recently, but they want to know more about the support and what are the support networks they can tap into. And I think for a country where there is no 911, you know, where there is no um, really systemic infrastructure for dealing with this, it provides a really inspiring um, uh, um, example of how women, when organized and when they have the right resources, like access to the mobile providers to get the free short um, code, are able to really band together and provide services um, that are incredibly needed. So social media, like the blog, has also, you know, we've really seen a huge impact just in the level of confidence and the, um, the ability to feel connected to others. You know, it can be very lonely to feel like you're still living in a camp, you don't have many services, feels sometimes like the world has forgotten them. So seeing women post blogs or even actually use Twitter um, and get responses from an international community is incredibly empowering. I mean, think about yourselves. For those of you who maybe are on Facebook or have any sort of online presence, you know what it feels like when somebody sends you a message and gives you positive feedback. Think what that's like for women who have never been on a computer before who've never been online before, who never had email before, to all of a sudden take a leap, work really hard to write something, put it online, even if it's just a paragraph, and get a positive response from an international community. It's been, it's just the way their faces light up and the power they see in the ability for their photos and their words to touch other people, it's been really powerful. Um, one story that I think is worth sharing, last fall, about, three weeks after we'd done the initial citizen reporting training um, pre-elections. One of the young women um, who we work with, who um, herself had been a victim of rape a couple of years ago and therefore is part of these grassroots networks, she came into um, one of the women's center with a, a, her cousin's um, daughter, who was five years old. And that young child had been raped um, by the next door neighbor in the tent camp where they lived. And she was devastated because she knew, of course, that this was happening, but of course, when it happens to a relative that you care about and somebody who's so young, it's just very hard to deal with. So she brought her um, to Kofa Viv's space. Um, they did the intake process to get all the information and find out whether or not the family wanted to pursue legal justice and so on. And this young woman, Elmita, um, she came to my colleague, Emily Reiser, and she said, I'm just so sad, I don't know what to do, but I think I want to write a blog post about it. So Emily sat down and helped her write a blog post, and she wrote a blog post about this young girl who had been raped and what that meant to her and how sad it was, and put it up on the blog. It got a lot of positive response. Of course, a lot of people were horrified 
Um, it encouraged actually Google to donate um, some mobile phones to the women that we work with. Um, and most of all, it gave Elmita a lot of confidence and it made her feel, it didn't, of course, how could it? It didn't take away the pain of what had happened, but it helped her feel like she could do something positive. So Elmita is now one of the women who actually works on the database and is entering this information and is really trying to harness this information to advocate for change. Um, as I said, the information from the database is being used um, and shared with a lot of you know, really prominent um, you know, uh, influential organizations is being shared with the government, um, really trying to put in, in place systems. Um, the government itself is working on updating their systems, uh, updating the national database for records of gender-based violence and so on. Last Friday was International Day to End Violence Against Women, and women all across Haiti were organized around that. And many of our grassroots partners um, participated in marches in Port-au-Prince, and there was a photo exhibit, actually a little bit bigger than the one that you saw outside. And that photo exhibit was visited by members of the international community. It was visited by members of parliament, Haitian parliament, by the UN police, UNHCR, uh, the national police, representatives from the Ministry of Public Health, the Canadian Embassy, many, many grassroots women who live in the camps themselves, as well as judges and national TV. Um, you know, photos themselves are just a starting point for a conversation, but again, when we talk about voice and we think about whose reality is being seen, it's a really powerful first step. Another thing that I think has been really inspiring has been the role of women peace builders to actually create work with male allies. So I wanna end with, um, with this story. So um, Kofa Viv has actually worked with men's groups and found male allies in the camps, brothers, husbands, um, nephews, just neighbors who care about women, who love the women in their lives and who are really horrified by all of the violence that, have, that has been happening. And so they've actually organized these groups of male allies who have been armed with mobile phones um, and flashlights, and they go around in the in a couple in two different camps, and they spend time actually talking to the women uh, and men in the camps, trying to do uh, education for other men, try to get other men onto the cause of we're here, you know, we're going to help, like we're going to work in, in tandem with women to protect them. They actually wear the name of the logo of the women's group uh, on their shirts, and and. Um, and then they also do accompaniment at night. So if women want to go to the bathroom, it's you know, something that has unfortunately become really dangerous, they'll do that. And they've actually seen the number of rapes go down in the two specific camps that they work. And I think that's really powerful. And I think you know this event is so important in highlighting the role of women. But of course, part of that question is how do men and women actually work together in an equal way to address these challenges? So. I'll end my remarks there and um, really thank you again for, for the opportunity to speak. I'd like to thank our last two speakers. Um, our next speaker is uh, Congresswoman Donna Edwards, who actually is uh, Bob McGuire's congresswoman from uh, Maryland. Uh, the congresswoman is en route. She had an earlier event this morning. And so when she gets here, um, she'll come in, we'll introduce her, and uh, she'll speak to us. In the interim, we have a few minutes, and so I'm gonna turn the, uh, the program over to Kathleen, and we'll invite your questions. Thank you very much, Bob, and I also wanna thank each of our speakers. Uh, each of you offered uh, a different perspective and very inspirational in the midst of very difficult times. I um, am actually going to take the initiative here and ask the first question and then we will open it up, if you don't mind. The US uh, Institute of Peace has been running a working group on lessons learned on women's programming in Afghanistan and Iraq. We have about seven years now of lessons learned. And four of the lessons learned I wanted to ask your comments on. One is to of course, understand the diversity of women 
And I think, uh, Michelle, you brought out this rural-urban tension. And I'd like it if you could just speak to what that is and if you could give us some more concrete examples. The second lesson learned is about the youth voice, though we've talked about women and young women. Is there a youth voice here, a united youth voice? Uh, Emily, you brought forward the issue of man. This has become a number one lessons learned out of Afghanistan and Iraq that it is going to be very difficult to make these changes without men. How do you bring men into being champions of these issues? And finally, um, Danielle, the voice of the religious leaders. What role do they play in one, helping to in gender-based violence, and to the empowerment of women. So I'm going to ask Michelle first. Uh, about the, the, uh, the gap between uh, urban and we were, we were women, I think that gap is, is, it reflects a larger gap uh, between urban communities and uh, rural communities in Haiti, men and women. And I think it has plagued us uh, for our 200 year uh, history. Uh, we were women being at the bottom of the ladder and having uh, more than any other group, the ability to express themselves, the ability to uh, uh, actually uh, participate in the community's life. Um, most of them are uh, market women, they play a role in agriculture, and, uh, uh, but that role is um, undervalued and uh, they still have the responsibilities uh, that go with uh, being a woman, motherhood, uh, taking care of children. And uh, um, the, uh, we have been dealing with that issue of inequality uh, between the rural world and the, the urban world for uh, uh, decades. And uh, uh, right now, uh, I think women uh, suffer the brunt of it. And, um, I don't know if I can make a story, one long story short. I think that's what I would say. Thank you. Emily? I think the question of youth voice is a, is a really powerful and important one. And I really am not an expert, but I will say that um, through our work, we've had the chance, op, uh, in, including working with many, many young women who are part of the grassroots groups and who um, you know, often take to the technology first and are really the most um, excited about it and really embrace it. And we've also have had the opportunity to work with many other groups of young people who are working on changing their community from mapping, um, from mapping the camps uh, to producing like, citizen journalism. And at an event that happened this spring, um, a bar camp, which is kind of a technology unconference, um, there were many young men and the young women that we brought to the table. And it was very cool to see them operating together I'm not sure that there's a unified youth voice yet, but I think it would be powerful if there were one. Um, in terms of bringing men into it, absolutely. And I think I've just been so inspired. The most recent time I was in um, Haiti, thanks to US Institute of Peace and Support, um, as we were leaving, there were two older women leaders um, of you know grassroots leaders, and they were talking to 25 or so members of this men's allies group. And how often in any setting, anywhere in the world, do you see young men kind of between the ages of 18 and 25, kind of tough, you know, like, like they're very tough, and just listening in total rapture to a 50-some-year-old woman who's like speaking so powerfully, um, and they're just like totally like, like, they're, they're like every word, they're hanging on every word, they could have repeated back exactly what she said, and that was powerful to see, and I think that subverts our ideas about hierarchy and gender dynamics and so on, so that power exists, but how do you tap into it? Um, I think it's really encouraging, encouraging that further. Thank you. I'm curious to hear what you would say. <laughs> to that. Uh, for the talk about the role of women and female senator. Uh, so we have a real actor there. <laughs> so I will turn the microphone to Edmond and he'll tell about the role. And we'll have our ambassador to translate for us. <laughs> we shall, you can translate for Edmond? Yeah. Elle a demandé le rôle de, des femmes sénateurs et surtout sur la question de violence et... faite aux femmes. C'était ça, Michel. C'est ça. C'est ça. ça. Mm -hmm. Bonjour. Richard, pourquoi tu as Richard, tu traduis pour moi yeah. Je te remercie. 
Tu prends, tu prends un autre micro. Le micro. Yeah, uh, Robert has a micro. Je te remercie. Euh, merci Daniel pour la possibilité pour moi pour moi prendre la parole. Et question question qui posait qui rôle sénateur qui rôle ont élu non par rapport à violence sous forme ou bien violence tout court. Ça mène que moi 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 adresser peut-être un petit jam je vais prendre deux minutes pour moi répondre et me mettre des questions dans un contexte. Dans l'autre contexte. Je vais vous donner un Je dis comme ça que les questions qui posent là, ça permet que je situe les réponses dans un contexte qui pillage. Elle va mettre la question dans un contexte, dans un plus grand contexte. C'est vrai que je n'ai pas pour la parole dans les gens qui ont charpenté et rencontré matin. Mais je me suis dit que si je parlais de violence, si je parlais de paix, je m'obligeais à mettre dans le contexte côté que je regardé l'économie pays, la politique pays et côté que la pauvreté comme cause structurelle t'a dû mener dans un pays qui a plus de violence. Uh, if I'm going to speak of uh, peace and violence, I have to look at the context, the economic context of the country, and uh, take all that into consideration. Parce que si m'a parlé de, si m'a regardé États-Unis comme pays, si m'a regardé Brésil, m'a regardé ce qui a passé Sao Paulo, si m'a regardé ce qui a passé Mexico City, qui surtout dans une zone qui est au près frontière là, au Texas, on est capable de questionner violence là en Haïti. If I'm going to look at uh, Brazil, uh, the United States, and Mexico, uh, and look at the violence there, uh, then I also have to look at the violence in Haiti. I'm not going to say exactly, but if you have a police for maybe 1,000 people, a police for 1,000 people, you have to ask yourself, is the problem real is violence? If we're looking at uh, one policeman for every thousand people, uh, is violence really the problem? Moi, je crois que parler de violence en Haïti, c'est d'abord parler de pauvreté. To speak of violence in Haiti, you have to speak of poverty. Qui rôle, moi-même comme sénateur ou bien comme élu, mais qu'a joué les n'a parlé de violence? What role can I play as a as a parliamentarian can, uh, when we're talking about violence? Parce que rôle moi t'as joué ce rôle n'importe qui parlementaire à travers le monde parce que Haïti pas un cas spécial. In that case, we're not special. I can I can play the same role as any parliamentarian around the world. C'est pas c'est pas parce que je veux esquiver la question. C'est surtout parce que je veux vous interpeller, vous qui êtes dans cette salle, vous qui êtes des jeunes étudiants, vous qui êtes des chercheurs. Vous qui êtes euh, membre d'ONG, travaillant en Haïti ou pas, j'aurais aimé vous interpeller de préférence pour vous dire que analyser le problème de la violence en Haïti, c'est vous interpeller chacun de vous, interpeller les parlementaires comme moi, vous interpeller pour vous dire que nous avons besoin que l'aide qui est donnée en Haïti soit donnée avec le cœur. L'appui qui arrive en Haïti... <laughs> I'm trying to implicate everyone who's here, whether you're um, from Haiti or you're part of an ONGO uh, NGO or, or, or anyone, anyone, someone who's a, a student, a researcher, uh, we should all be implicated in, in the pro problems that are being faced in Haiti. J'aurais pu vous donner des, des exemples, mais je ne veux pas vous retenir dans la mesure où je suis là uniquement pour répondre à une question. I can give many examples. Mais je veux vous dire, pour répondre à une question, il faut traduire to tout. To même. I'm trying, I'm trying. Mais c'est vraiment le sénateur haïtien, ou bien la sénateur, ou bien un député, doit répondre via l'élaboration de loi, ou du moins faire mettre dans le budget des fonds devant permettre à l'État haïtien de faire face à ce type de problème. 
we have to put, uh, the parliamentarians have to put these in the budget so that we can address these problems. It has to uh, uh, be addressed by us, but we have to take an official um, approach to it where there's a budget allotted for it, and then we can therefore address these problems. Combattre la pauvreté aidera à combattre la violence, quel que soit, quel que soit le pays. If we fight poverty, we can fight violence. Combattre l'exclusion, et surtout l'exclusion des femmes, dans, la prise, dans les prises de décision, permettra à combattre la violence. If we fight the exclusion of women, then we can fight violence. Travailler d'abord pour, pour la population, pour les communautés, et papa travailler pour soi aidera aussi à combattre la violence. Working for the community rather than working for oneself will help to fight the violence. Quand on est parlementaire dans un pays où lorsque vous prenez la parole pour dénoncer les choses et qu'on vous demande de vous taire, croyez-moi, c'est pas when facile. When you take the, 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 the voice, when you speak as a parliamentarian, you're speaking for a country. Vous parlez trop. Quand on vous dit que vous parlez trop. When they tell you you speak too much. Mais ça vient aussi de l'international. Hein? L'international peut vous demander, s'il vous plaît, il faut vous taire parce que vous parlez trop. Sometimes the internationals can tell you that you speak too much also. C'est pas facile, merci. It's not easy. <laughs> thank you, Senator, and also thank you, Richard Morse, Special Assistant to President Martelli. Thank you. I think on that note, Bob, did you want to weigh in here on any of these most recent comments before I open it up to the audience? Okay, um, something I wanted to mention um, was this issue of the youth voice, which I think is incredibly important. Um, obviously, Haiti has a very young population. I think it's something like 70% of the population is 29 years or younger. And, um, and, and, and that population um, has grown up in a time of, of instability and, and disappointment and unfulfilled expectations. Um, but yet, I, I think there's tremendous hope in, in that um, segment of the population. And I hearken back to something, I know Richard, you know a lot about this as a musician, about three years ago when there was a, a, a terrible automobile accident, three or four members of Haiti's most popular kind of, if we could say, rap group, the Barricade crew, um, were killed in that. And, and one of the things that I've been turned on to increasingly in Haiti by, by cab drivers and, and porters and anybody else I can talk to is the importance of listening to that music. And, and it gives you some sense and understanding of the pathos and frustration and aspirations of young people. And, and when, that, um, when, that, when those musicians died, there was a um, almost spontaneous um, memorial service that was occurred on the Shamars. Um, and as I recall, something like 100,000 or so people assembled in peace and, and in quiet, um, to not just to rever their fallen heroes, but to kind of show their presence and to feel that they were being neglected. Um, they were being neglected by the rest of the population. So it, it, it's incredibly important, I think, to focus on the youth issue. Um, it encompasses both men and women, of course, but, but also to realize that young people need to dream, young people need to have aspirations, and in, in, the, in Haiti these days, that's something that um, is, is a very difficult commodity and is something that needs a, a tremendous amount of attention. Thank you, Bob. I think, Barbara, you have something to say on this as well. Do you, if you want to take uh, the, the microphone right La there. participation des jeunes. participation des jeunes. Oui, tu vas chanter Yeah. Good morning. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna express myself by a song. <laughs> so, I don't know. We pass on the season of the year. We take our bien mal. We look at it, but we don't want to be. We are the women who have resistance. 
Nous passer journée sans manger, nous traverser désert à pied, nous faire nuit sans pas faire mes jeunes. Nous ces femmes qui gagnent résistance au résistance au résistance au. Nous ces femmes qui gagnent résistance au. Nous apprenons marcher en bataille, qu'un souffle nous en ballon mais défend tête nous contre toute mauvaise. Nous ces femmes qui gagnent résistance au. Yo pile yo pa ka krasen yo mouye yo pa ka nou di pase on wash color wash nou se fom ki genye resistance so. yo fè nou kon chime prison fè men nan ka concentration men nou pa perdi direction nou se fom ki genye resistance so. l'esclavage ou l'occupation on y est pas jamais arrivé faire fin. Nous qu'on peut nous chaper en bas tout mon neveu. Nous ces femmes qui gagnent résistance au. Nal nal en fait ça nous pas mourir. Nous toque qu'on nous a crucifié. Nous dim ciel nous quoi non paradis. Nous ces femmes qui gagnent résistance. I don't know we're gonna translate that. A plus de la fin. If you want to do a line by line, I'll, I'll help you with it. But <laughs> we are women who have resistance and who have courage. I think that's basically what she's saying, in spite of it all. Thank you, Barbara. On that note, we're going to open it up. Questions, comments from the audience. If you could, please, uh, there are microphones on both sides. And uh, if you could find a microphone and very briefly introduce yourself and even more briefly, your comment or question. We, I know we have a lot of people here who have stories as well. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much. My name is Elise Young, and I work with Action Aid, and we have an office in Haiti for 14 years, and are supporting the land and housing rights movement with a platform called Genanger that works with, among other women's groups, uh, CONAFAP, uh, the largest national group of women um, producers, uh, peasant movement, and Fondacide. And I had a question for Madame Saint-Lot. Um, so this National Women's Platform for Action, uh, yeah, of course, but um, Montas had mentioned this divide between rural and, and urban populations in the country, and we've, we've definitely seen that working on land and housing rights with some of the women, women's peasant movements throughout the country, who I think are very eager to be involved with some of the national decision-making some plans coming out of the, the Ministry of Women's Affairs and are having trouble finding the access points um, like for the entire development process. So I just wanted to see if you have advice um, for women's movements who are, are interested in getting involved with the National Women's Platform for Action, how they might go about that, especially if perhaps they're more rurally associated. Thank you, and I'm going to just take one more question and then give you a moment to think and Again, your question. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for your presentations. My name is Rosemary Seguero. Mm -hmm. I'm the president of Hope for Tomorrow. Our organization focuses on uh, job creation through entrepreneurship. And I just want to say thank to God for seeing all Haiti women here, most of the Haitian women. When a Haiti uh, earthquake uh, uh, happened in Haiti, we worked day and night at the embassy, food shop, doing packing things to go to Haiti. What I want to say that women all over the world, I come from Kenya, women all over the world are the same. And you don't have to be a professional to know women issues and women needs. So if all women here in the United States, Africa, everywhere, they are the same. If we unite, women are strong, especially African black women and everybody. We can do a lot and 
I think what you are doing in Ahiti is so great. Uh, we used our organization with other organizations to get funds to help Ahiti. So what you have done and bringing us together here is very, very important. Thanks to Institute of Peace. I have always attended the event here, especially also the young lady with the democracy, TikTok democracy. Thank you for all that you are doing and uh, uh, through today and maybe from today we still want to collaborate i'm also an entrepreneur a woman business so and a non-profit women can develop their own countries through business and what we are doing thank you so much and god bless you all much as well and we'll take one more question before we bring it back to the panel and then we'll take the other two yes hi my name is yoon kyung shin i'm from south korea uh, the master's student in Iwa Women's University. And uh, I learned uh, from uh, Daniele that having we learned that financing uh, development program is very critical and important to do all these very uh, important gender-based uh, initiatives. So I was just uh, wondering, uh, have you ever seen, uh, to open to all the panels, have you ever seen the non-traditional donors, uh, how they uh, sort of provide a gender-focused aid to uh, in their uh, programs or profiles, and uh, especially the donors that are not inside of OECD Development Assistance Committees. So how they integrate uh, their um, aid policies uh, for gender uh, equality. So that was my question, especially in the context of the Haiti. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, and I think we have one more question, so I'm going to. My name is Pat McCardle. I'm a retired Foreign Service officer and a volunteer with Solar Cookers International. One thing that hasn't been discussed this morning is cooking, which is something very important to Haitian women. And I know that charcoal is the main fuel right now. Um, but Haiti has abundant sunshine, a lot of sunshine. Uh, my organization and others have uh, introduced solar cooking into Haiti in a small way, but it's all private funding. I understand the U.S. government's about to fund a large introduction of um, LPG gas into Haiti. And I'm just wondering how you see Haitian families affording, over the long term, bottled gas every month. And uh, if you have any comments on why we shouldn't exploit more Haiti's most abundant resource, which is sunshine. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, I'm going to bring it back to the panel, and then I see some other uh, Q&A possibly opportunities. So, Danielle, would you like to take the lead? Yes, I want to answer to Action Ed. <laughs> um, for this platform, we have a specific methodology that we are following so that we can have science results. As I said, we're going to have, we are, the focus group are happening right now. We're going to have 350 focus group with uh, like 12 to 15 women in each focus group. And there will be a lot of women, mostly from the rural areas and uh, let's say underserved community. But at the end of December, and that's where we need you, we will be really using SMS just to confirm what has been you know, discussed in the focus group you know, reflect the whole population, not only women, men, women, and children, and the youth, but focusing on women issues and community issues. And for the national, you know, forum, we will have a broad, broad, broad coverage of community radios, uh, radios with big coverage. So that's why I'm not, we're not talking about a project. It's an initiative which will tend to be like a movement. And having the parliamentarians in, involved, it's really the best way to be able to touch the rural, remote, remote communities because they are the real voices of the people, because they are elected. We are not talking about the ones that are funded by drugs money. We are talking about women like Edmon. We're talking like women like Barbara. So that's why we really think that we should build institution. NGO can't build this country. They can help. We have to work with political parties. We have to work with 
parliament. We have to go with the Women Affairs Ministry so that we can really reach the communities all over the countries. And using the media, it's the really, really important tool that we have. That's the only way, you know, 90% of Asian politi poli uh, population have a radio at home. Michelle or Emily, would you like to weigh in on that? Or on non-traditional donors? Uh, I just, uh, I don't have enough, uh, enough information on, uh, on, uh, on the issue. Uh, Non-traditional donors, uh, how much impact do they have and uh, who do they, do they really reach? Uh, th there is one big problem about everything we have been talking about this morning. It's a lack of data, of reliable data about women participation, about violence. You know, uh, I think uh, uh, something was said earlier. I mean, violence is not, when they talk about Haiti, they see violence. But when you, we take Haiti in the context of the, uh, the continent, Haiti is certainly not the most violent country in the, the whole area. So I think it's uh, 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 the lack of data is one of the main pro problems we have in uh, dealing with whether it is international aid, whether it is uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the problems that women are confronting. Uh, how are we going to get uh, that data is difficult. In the case of Haiti, it's not just about women. We just are lacking data on a number of, of issues and problems, and uh, we cannot really uh, pick up the challenges and face them if we don't have that data. Maybe Daniel has some more on this. As you said, there is no data, but talking about non-traditional you know, donors, I would like to talk about the experience that we had after the earthquake. Uh, our organization is 10 years old, we have been supported by the IDB, the USAID, European Community, uh, European Community and different donors and the private sector. But after the earthquake, you know, we are almost closing our doors because we couldn't pay our staff. We couldn't, you know. And actress Maria Bello, a friend from before the earthquake. So she had a designer make a pendant and raise money for us. It was nothing. It was like forty, forty-five thousand dollars But I can tell you, it was like 450000 at this moment. And I, and I see what her team and her are realizing at Cité Soleil in War of Jeremy, where no NGO want to be because of the violence. Now, Alida, may, you may talk about what you're doing. It's non-traditional donors' money. Tell about what you, you, go. <laughs> you can talk better than I. <laughs> yeah, there's a microphone She doesn't there. need translation. She's Haitian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm the, uh, I'm, the, I'm the white Haitian down in City Soleil. That's what my girls always say. Um, I'm Alita Frischman. I'm the executive director of We Advance. Um, we did start this organization after the earthquake. It is 100% Haitian, except for me. Um, we have four co-founders and um, a board of executives that are all Haitian um, women. We um, run our clinic on less than well under $20,000 um, a month. We employ about 20 um, Haitians. We see about um, 150 uh, people a day in our medical clinic. We have over 125 um, local community people that are in our English class. We see about 100 to 150 kids a day um, in our activities and also in our safe spaces. And we have a number of outreach organizations and grassroots movements um, from women's organizations and teaching them how to organize and what a grassroots is to it, the empowerment programs where we are teaching kids, women, and children about first aid techniques all the way through to um, human rights. So uh, we're out there and, and teaching these programs. And I'm sorry I'm shivering. It's freezing. I'm used to <laughs> Thank Haiti you weather. Thank so much. <laughs> and uh, I think we might just get only one more uh, question in, and I believe you were here and then you, and then we'll go that way. I, but I do believe the Congresswoman is arriving shortly. So we might not get to the answers at this part of the program, but we will reconvene the panel after the Congresswoman speaks. Please, briefly. Hello, my name is Alexandra Nisla and I work for the Inter-American Development Bank. 
We've addressed the issue of data a little bit, but I think we need to go a little bit beyond looking at monitoring and evaluation, which is often lacking. I mean, there are reports, there is things coming out, but I would like to know from, from all of you, and particularly, obviously, Emily is taking monitoring and evaluation probably to, to a different level, to a digital level. How can we make it better? And how can we involve the local actors in the monitoring and evaluation to show, to showcase what we're doing, but also to, to address the issues of um, lessons learned, to see how can we make it better in the future? That would be my question. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Yeah. Is it working? OK. <laughs> um, this is uh, sort of related for Ms. Jacoby. Your, your um, name, please, sir. Oh, Ken Meyer Cord. Um, your story about uh, how few ladies had ever taken a picture suggests that access to digital technology in Haiti is very limited. Doesn't that make digital democracy inherently elitist? Okay, next question. We're going to keep moving the questions and then open it up to the panel. Uh, bonjour, Veronique Pluvios. Uh, my question is um, two, uh, and I really would like a direct answer on this instead of it being piled up, because sometimes in piling up the questions, we don't get a real detailed response from the panelists. We, we will One do our is best. what, with regard to the. Hello? The women legislators and Madame Senlo, Madame Motas, and others, have any of you been specifically contacted um, and inquired and provided in detail what you would recommend to international donors who disproportionately support Haiti? What exactly you would recommend for the improve governance of all of Haiti. And I would really like it if you could share that with us because part of the challenge is that people say we should talk to the women, we should involve them, but we never really have any evidence that people are actually taking your suggestions and incorporating them into their plans. So if the senator and the women in uh, authority in Haiti could answer that, that would be great. And in answering, can you please give some recommendations to frustrated members of the Haitian diaspora who want to see how they can be helpful but are feeling frustrated both by actors here as well as actors in Haiti? Thank you. Thank you very much. And. Uh, we will come back to your question. We have our uh, Congresswoman who has arrived and we are going to shift the program and then we will come back together as a panel. Thank you all for the very good questions and we have them here in front of us. Bob, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thanks very much. I have a weather report for you. I hope you all brought your umbrellas. It's mm -hmm. raining very heavily outside, and we're very grateful to Congresswoman Edwards for having swam through the rain to get here this morning to be with us. I'd like to uh, introduce to you the uh, president of the United States Institute of Peace, Dr. Richard Solomon. I'm not sure I deserve any particular clap, but uh, thank you for your welcome, but it's my honor <clears throat> to say a few words about uh, the work of the Institute on Haiti and to welcome our, our honored guest. We're one of the few institutions, in, in fact, Bob Perito tells me just about the only one that has a continuing, if you like, watching brief and range of activities uh, on the Haiti situation. The powerful images we saw on television after the earthquake, of course, helped to mobilize everybody's concern and we were fortunate that uh, Bob, given his expertise and his constant involvement on issues related to Haiti, was able to help the U.S. Navy uh, as it mobilized relief supplies and otherwise tried to help uh, deal with the aftermath uh, of the earthquake. And of course, the other aspect of our work is reflected in the panel discussion and uh, the work here today. Uh, Kathleen Keenest, who uh, leads our work on uh, gender issues and peace building uh, has, uh, I think, helped to keep everyone focused on, on this set of issues. Indeed, she met with uh, Congresswoman Edwards uh, up on the Hill not too long ago. Uh, they were talking about issues of how we could help uh, the women in Afghanistan contribute to stabilizing that very difficult uh, situation. 
But let me uh, say a few words about uh, Congresswoman uh, Edwards. Uh, she's been long a real activist on issues of uh, gender issues, on uh, peace building activities. Before joining Congress, she was the executive director of the ARCA Foundation, which is a grant making institution that uh, supports issues related to uh, social activism, human rights uh, development. And in Congress, she has been uh, particularly active on uh, women's issues. She was uh, a leader in the effort to get the 1994 uh, uh, Act on uh, uh, Violence Against Women passed by, uh, by President Clinton and uh, is active with the uh, Tom Lantros uh, Human Rights Caucus. So she brings a lot of expertise and activism to her, uh, her work on this range of issues that we'll be talking about uh, today. So uh, on behalf of the Institute and uh, our partner, Vital Voices, I'm really very uh, pleased that Congresswoman Ed Edwards could be with us today, please. Thank you very much, Ambassador Solomon, and it's actually really wonderful to be here at the U.S. Institute uh, for Peace. And of course, the work that I've known that um, the Institute has done for many years uh, in my days at ARCA and before, and it's a really uh, delight to be able to celebrate that with you here today. And I'm uh, particularly grateful to be here also with uh, my good friends from Vital Voices. Um, when I was at the ARCA Foundation, I think we made one of the first foundation grants to Vital Voices as it was um, starting up, supporting um, the um, investment in women that I think is really important all over the world. I mean, it shouldn't be a surprise that uh, I've taken a particular focus on women in Afghanistan, but also women in Haiti and women uh, throughout the world because uh, we've all read the reports over the years about the importance of investing in women because women invest in communities, they invest in their families, they build nations. Um, but very often we haven't uh, done that in a way that um, makes sense and that proves the words of what that investment can mean. Um, and, you know, I don't, not to be disparaging, but I do think that we give a lot of lip service. I could hear some of that uh, from the comments as I came in about the importance invest of investing in women and the importance of women in Haiti, uh, but we haven't really put the meat um, to that. Uh, to that bone. We haven't made certain that those investments are done in a kind of way that really will help uh, the uh, help Haitian women to be a real part of rebuilding Haiti so that it uh, thrives and survives in the 21st century. I had the um, privilege of being able to travel to Haiti when I first came into the Congress after Haiti had been hit by four horrific hurricanes and um, devastated that devastation on top of prior devastation. And then the earthquake came and I visited Haiti again and stood in the Congress uh, to argue um, and to discuss uh, with our colleagues of the importance of making a real investment in Haiti because unlike Afghanistan and other places around the world, which you know, I certainly agree that we um, need to invest in, in peace building, Haiti is in this hemisphere. And um, I think that we prove something to ourselves and to the rest of the world when we have a thriving Haiti that survives in our own hemisphere. And I think women are so much a, a part of that. I mean, you have only to, um, uh, to travel as many of you have as I have uh, to Haiti and you talk to women and the women of Haiti know the kinds of investments that need to be made in uh, health, in education, in the general welfare, um, in the economy. The women understand that. Um, but we have to come together here, both here in the United States and I think as leaders with our international partners uh, to make those investments come to life. Also investing in the political life of women in Haiti, and most especially uh, the political life of the women of Haiti. Uh, I, I, when I think about the devastation that occurred after the earthquake, I think for so many of us, it meant also an opportunity, tragedy, but an opportunity to rethink 
how it is that we can help uh, Haiti recover and build in this new century. Um, and unfortunately, there, um, as has happened in the past, our attention on Haiti has waxed and waned. Um, and this has been the story of the United States relationship with Haiti for, uh, for so long. I think that we have to change that story. Um, we have to change that story by making sure that uh, when we're paying attention to what happens in individual communities in Haiti, that both in terms of investing in uh, women's ability to participate in the political process, that they also have to be able to do that uh, safely. Uh, to participate in their communities, they have to be able to do that safely. Uh, and part of my interest, it isn't just a foreign interest, um, to me, but my interest in the women of Haiti actually comes from women who live in the 4th Congressional District in Maryland, the women who form uh, the Haitian diaspora who live in Silver Spring and Gaithersburg and all throughout uh, Prince George's County. And their voices have been heard by uh, members of Congress like me who ordinarily, um, on the face of it, would not have to take an interest in what happens with the women in Haiti. I think about the women who are members of a church in uh, downtown Silver Spring who came to me and said, please, what is it that you can do? Um, what is it that you, how is it that you can get your colleagues in the Congress to understand what it is that we need to do from a development and economic development perspective to assist women in thriving, um, in, thriving in our home country? And they weren't talking about what it is that we could give. They were talking about uh, an investment that could be made in the women of Haiti that would allow them uh, to determine for themselves their uh, political, economic, and, uh, and, and health future. And so that's what I'd like to share with you today. I think that uh, for certain when women are um, armed with both information and resources, they can figure out the things to do for themselves. I mean, I look, I, when I visited um, Haiti this last, uh, this last time, I met with women who are doing, um, they're doing work on anti-violence against women. They're doing uh, work to help uh, surviving children in, in orphanages. They're doing work uh, to help uh, build their economic uh, future. That work is not foreign to them, um, but they can't do it all by them, all by themselves, and they have to know that we're all prepared to invest in uh, in the kinds of democratic institutions that will allow them to survive and to and to thrive. Um, and we know that you know these that the emergencies that occur um, sometimes are really rooted in in, in gender-based violence in Haiti, but also around the world. And so we can't separate those things that are such a presence in women's lives from what it takes to invest in what will help them, um, help them to survive. In the, the wake of the, um, the earthquake, we know that women have fa faced really difficult um, circumstances that um, have been in, in existence for a long time, but have been exacerbated um, by the tragedy, by the disaster, and by a lack of aid that comes in the most useful way. Um, when I, um, I visited um, one um, encampment um, outside, just outside of Port-au-Prince, and uh, when I talked to, I remember speaking with um, a young mother, and um, she had two of her children, but she had been separated um, from one of her children. She had skills that she could use, perhaps to earn a living, but had nowhere um, to get to and to buy equipment in order to, um, in order to do that. And when, when we asked, um, and I was with, our, um, with Congressman Hoyer, with our uh, then majority whip at the, at the time, and when we asked her what it is that she needed, she didn't say to us that uh, what she needed was for us to just give her something. What she said is that she knows how to take care of her children. She knows how to take care of her family. She wants to work to do that. And she wants to know that there are people in government, in her own government, who understand, uh, who, who are there and who understand 
her needs, but she needed us to know that as well because, um, and, and it was amazing because there was a pride about her um, that all of us understand in our own, in our own lives uh, and not because we wanted somebody just to give us something but because we knew we had the capacity within ourselves to make our lives better for our, our children. Um, very recently, the UN uh, Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women said if we're to secure women's rights and their freedom for violence, it's imperative that we adopt an integrated human rights perspe perspective that stresses the equal importance of civil and political rights and economic and social rights. And unless women can develop their uh, capabilities and achieve economic independence, the human rights they are promised will not be realized. This is especially true um, in Haiti given its violence and uh, violence-plagued history. We also know that uh, violence in some ways is, might be thought of as inevitable. We have to ensure that the institutions on the ground have the capacity to deal with that violence. And as the government continues to deal with overwhelming challenges of rebuilding an economy and um, and uh, cholera outbreak and other kinds of uh, horrific health outcomes, it's really important for us to look at this transition opportunity that we have to rethink the lives of women and girls in Haiti. It is perhaps uh, you know, a moment that we could not have predicted um, several years ago, but it really is an opportunity. I often think, though, in the um, and especially in these times in the Congress when we are almost every day arguing to uh, gut every bit of foreign aid that we, um, that we provide, that we have a real challenge in this country of helping people to understand the value of that aid. But we also have an obligation to make sure that that assistance goes out in a way that there is, in fact, value for it. And we need people on the ground, and especially in Haiti, we need women on the ground validating uh, that the way in which they've received assistance actually has value in their lives. I'm not always certain uh, that we can, uh, can point to that. I think one of the uh, concerns that I expressed when I last visited Haiti is that we, uh, as we've taken in so many other countries, have taken this sort of programmatic um, or project-based um, uh, approach rather than a programmatic based approach. And so we fund a project here and we fund a project there and then we hope that somehow those projects all knit together to make a difference when in fact we have to take a much longer view making investments that may not actually pay off this year or next year but down the line because you've made those kinds of, uh, kinds of investments will. I think um, with respect to uh, to Haiti, that is very often what we've done, not just over a year or two, it's what we've done over decades. Um, a hit or miss project here or there that doesn't quite knit into a fabric of a program that's going to make a difference in people's lives. I think it is fundamentally a different way that you approach uh, foreign assistance. And obviously in the, um, the constrained fiscal environment in which we are, um, you know, it, what is a, in effect, you know, sort of a small country in Haiti becomes a much larger issue from a, a, a funding perspective, but it's in our, um, our unique national interest, and not just security interest, but our national interest in this hemisphere to make those kinds of investments in uh, communities and on, a, on the ground that will pay off over the long, over the long term. Um, I, 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 I think, you know, one of the other challenges that uh, that we have is also hearing from the voices of women um, in communities. Uh, too often, and this, uh, this actually happened more um, most recently um, on, in some of our discussions, some members of the Congressional Black Caucus who've had long had an uh, interest in Haiti in, in which um, we hear from um, an elite group, but we don't really hear from people who are working in communities. And our challenge, if we really are to make people's lives, uh, help people, um, enable people to, uh, to make their lives better, then that communication has to go from what is at an elite level to what's on the ground. Um, and so I, I, I want to um, just close by, by sharing with you that um, I, I believe that in this hemisphere, 
um, Haiti and the circumstance of Haitian women in their political and economic participation cannot any longer be an afterthought. Um, it actually should be rather embarrassing for us here in the United States to have um, this, um, you know, this country that is so much a part of the fabric of who we are as Americans um, unable to survive in the way that it needs to in our own backyard. And, uh, and it isn't just about the 4th Congressional District of Maryland, of which I am more day-to-day -day and deeply uh, concerned and can hear from the voices of the Haitian diaspora a plea uh, for us not to wax and wane anymore. And I don't think that the women of Haiti can afford that. I think that there's a lot that we can do in, um, in building successful democratic institutions that embrace, um, embrace all of the people of Haiti, including its women. I think that we can help build economic institutions um, and investments that don't continue to rape a country and leave it um, unwhole. Uh, I think that we can also invest in the future of the Haitian children who will be able to grow up in peace and without uh, violence and disease and all of the things that have afflicted past generations. Uh, and that we have to do that in a way that both meets community needs but also listens and responds to the voices on the ground. And so I know that you're going to get back to your panel discussion, but I want to thank you very much for welcoming uh, me here. And I say in some way, I, mean, I, I suppose I should ask, are any, do any of you happen to live in the 4th Congressional District in Maryland? <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, and, and the reason I say that is because I think the final challenge um, for me as a member of Congress, and I know that other members of Congress feel this too, is that when we, um, we require ourselves to think outside of our own worlds, to think outside of our own borders of the counties in which we live, that we are challenged uh, by people who only want us to think about what is uniquely right at home and right in our neighborhoods. That's not a world that we can afford. It's actually not a world that Haiti can afford. And, um, and so I would ask all of us to go back to wherever it is um, uh, from which we hail uh, to ask us to think outside of our own borders. And that will be the greatest success uh, for the people of Haiti. It will be a greater success for the women of Haiti. Thank you very much. You have a few minutes. I, I know that there I was are. Trying to get a signal. <laughs> <laughs> we would love you to uh, stay for a few minutes and join our discussion. I, I actually would like to open up to the panelists uh, in case they might have a comment or question to you, Congresswoman, and then open it up to the audience. We have until 12 noon today. Yes, Bob. Um, Congresswoman Edwards, I'm, I'm actually one of your constituents, so welcome. <laughs> Um, I thought you said something very important when you said that if, if people, and, and women in specific, have information and resources, they can figure out what to do for themselves. Um, and, and I think sometimes there's a certain paternalism that is enacted in foreign aid as well. Um, I've been doing a lot of work lately on looking at cash transfer and conditional cash transfer programs. They're very successful in Mexico, uh, Brazil, and, and other countries in the world. And, uh, and I just wonder um, what you, as a, someone who holds the purse strings of the US um, government, in a sense, um, <laughs> um, what would you think of the idea of um, support of some sort of a cash transfer or conditional cash transfer program in Haiti, which of course would benefit um, many, many women and their families? <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I think that, um, you know, part of the challenge of Haiti being so close and yet so far is that um, our history of experience with Haiti and with, um, with various elements of, of um, various Haitian governments has not, 
I think it would be a stretch to say that it's been a great success. And I think as a result, there's been a tremendous amount of skepticism about whether uh, programs like that actually um, would work in Haiti. I don't know that I share that skepticism. Um, I also believe in small. Um, I think that sometimes, um, and this is particularly true in our foreign assistance, that we think in you know, such huge terms, in terms of the amount of money that's needed just to get something going, that it actually constrains our ability to do things that are small and meaningful and that can make a difference. And, um, and so, you know, it's been, it, so for example, um, investing in things like micro lending or even uh, uh, cash uh, transfer is so far beyond the way that we traditionally think of our foreign assistance because we deal at some levels that are unimaginable for someone who lives in a small community or in a small village. Um, but I think it's worth experimenting. I think that we have to do some profoundly different things with the way that we deliver foreign assistance and the way that we think about it. I don't, I mean, I think that we can always point to areas where there have been successes, obviously, in our delivery of foreign assistance, but we can also point to a lot of places where um, the, the success has been at the top, but it hasn't been matched by success on the ground, and I think uh, cash transfer programs are those kind of things that actually could make a real difference in a community, in a life, um, in a village um, that that aren't you know sort of a big you know some mega um, government project. Thank you, Congresswoman. I'm going to start now with our audience and. Uh, questions for my questions for uh, for uh, all right. Daniel Sama. Uh, then let's let's continue with questions for the congresswoman. Or I, I'd love to hear the questions <laughs> for the panel. So. <laughs> well, I know you have a very limited time. <laughs> I have one question here. Thank you. Congresswoman Edwards, uh, thank you for being here today. Uh, my name is Marjorie Brennan, and I direct a um, foundation, the JDT Foundation, which is related to education um, in Haiti. And we've talked a lot today about many things with women, and I keep coming back to the idea of our youth and education, that to a large extent, so much of the issues that are going on can be eventually addressed if you're taking a long-term view with educating particularly women in Haiti. And you discussed some programmatic things that you would like to see happen in Haiti. Is education one of those things? Oh, education definitely is. But I also think that it's true whether it's here in the United States and all over the world. I mean, I've seen this, you know, at work uh, right now in Afghanistan, that when you begin to make investment in women's education, that they transfer that investment to their children. And uh, they think about their children's prospects differently. And so, again, I think this goes to the question of how we uh, rethink our assistance, whether that is private uh, philanthropy or it's, um, or it's government assistance, that um, making it, it, it's, I just don't even think we need any more research to know that when you invest in women, you invest in communities. We don't, <laughs> we have studied it, we know. And whether that is about education, or it's about economic development, or it's about building democracy, or, I mean, you just go down the list. And, um, and I don't know why we keep trying to think that there's another solution here. And, um, you know, the people of Vital Voices and so many of our, uh, you know, really great humanitarian organizations know this because it's their experience. Um, when I was in philanthropy, we knew it um, as well, but we haven't transferred that knowledge in the way that we need to um, to, um, to our, our, our governments. And I think that Secretary Clinton, I have to give her amazing, enormous credit because I think for the, really for the first time we have a Department of State, a Secretary of State who actually understands that, and maybe it was Vital Voices that helped her understand that too, <laughs> um, but who really does understand that and who's made a greater effort than we've seen in um, probably ever um, in trying to inject um, 
this is a pra this kind of uh, assessment as a practice in assistance um, when we think of foreign assistance. So we just need to do it more. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. And I understand that uh, you are on to your next meeting. We appreciate your really candid and cogent comments today. It's, uh, I think, really, uh, you, you walked into a process already in motion, and you totally re-emphasize the things that we were in discussion. So I really appreciate it. Well, On behalf of the Institute, thank you so much for taking time Well, today. thank you very much. I appreciate it. And I have to tell you, I mean, part of the reason I could do that, you know, it's because my mother taught me well, so. <laughs> <laughs> Up from where we uh, left off, and we have our first question in this part of the session. Go ahead, Rusty. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Rusty Barber, and first of all, thanks again to my, my colleagues, uh, Kathleen and, and Bob McGuire and Bob Prieto, for putting on a, a, a terrifically informative event. Actually, building on the Congressman's comment about the importance of investing in women to help a society in crisis stabilize itself, uh, we're hoping to do something to do exactly that in uh, Caracol on the north coast of Haiti. And uh, I have a question specifically for Danielle saint Lo, and to set up the question, uh, let me first state that I, I'm here today on behalf of a, of a, uh, a public-private uh, partnership that is establishing, uh, hopes to establish a candle manufacturing uh, facility at Caracol at the industrial park under construction with the assistance of the U.S. government. And uh, we hope that we'll employ quite a lot of Haitian women one concern we have, however, is that it not be an enclaved uh, activity. And so my specific question for you, by the way, the public partner is, uh, is Prosperity Candle, which is a, 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 an organization that enables uh, women's entrepreneurship in conflict-affected uh, zones. The private sector partner is the largest manufacturer of candles uh, in uh, North America. Candles. So that's right, candles. That's what I said. So I, I actually, just candles. And, um, but uh, my question specifically for you is what is the best conduit with the Haitian government today, now, uh, to gain support for this initiative? So, as I said, it does not remain an, an, an effort that's enclaved in the North. All right, thank you so much. And I'm going to loop around now that we've just brought our, our audience back in, and I'm going to open the panel up to answering the questions just before the Congresswoman arrived. So uh, those questions are on the table as well. And uh, who would like to take the lead? Uh, well, uh, I would. Thanks, uh, To answer the, the uh, question that was asked from uh, the young uh, woman from the Haitian diaspora, we express the frustration of the diaspora of not being able, not knowing how to help. And uh, the question was very direct. She asked us whether we had made any recommendations and uh, whether we had felt that we were, we were heard uh, to international donors for, for instance, improved governance. Um, you know, she was very direct. She wanted a direct answer. Uh, and I think it has been, uh, for me to give a direct answer, uh, I have to say that uh, uh, it has not been easy to uh, really get the international donors to understand the Haitian point, point of view. Uh, I found myself uh, being an international civil servant, but being Haitian and uh, being implicated, being the special advisor at MINUSTA, I faced that dilemma over and over again. Uh, when, for instance, you talk about uh, what to do about the displaced in the camps, the, res the, the response we had from the international community was what they wanted to do is build camps like Corais which were uh, camps where you had rows of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, tents, one next to the other. And uh, because this is the way they had done in Aceh, this is the way they had done in other places. And uh, I have to say that I share her frustration on this. Uh, I have often felt that the point of view of Haitians, that the displaced preferred to go back to their old neighborhood whenever that was possible and be given the means to actually themselves rebuild their houses, of course, under certain conditions, uh, this <coughs> was not heard. So those parallel viewpoints about how uh, the issue of the tents of the displaced would be handled, uh, I think until now it plagues Haiti. 
um, now, uh, the frustration about how the differences in, in point of view uh, and whether we felt that our recommendations has, uh, uh, you know, have gone forward, uh, I do feel at times, uh, I personally, I feel I've made a difference. Uh, however, very often, I felt the same frustration that was expressed earlier, you know, uh, of not being able to uh, convey uh, the, the, the point of view of the people uh, who are the recipients of the aid and from, to the people who are actually the donors. Thank you. Yes, Daniel. And I think it's for all of us in Haiti the same frustration. And most international donors, they speak English. We don't, we don't speak Creole. So they can hear us. <laughs> and what is very frustrating, it's especially people like me that are we sure that speak English. is a pressure on us to be in meetings, to be in clusters, while we know that we are not going to be heard. And I remember. Just after the earthquake, I came here. I went to different you know, meetings saying, hey, let's split into groups, telling that to our government, telling that here, we need to have a group in relief and start the reconstruction process right away because we had 500,000 people that has moved in the rural areas back home. So now they are back in, in Port-au-Prince because there were no service for them and there were enough money to have them to reorganize, reorganize them in their community. Still, we are still in the relief. Like our organization, we, are in, we have projects in the Southeast. And while we wanted to plant yam, they wanted to give us money for cash for work, food for work. When we ask some UNICEF to provide them with mandarins to give to the children in the camps so that they can have vitamin C and have fruits. And it's, you know, they told, oh, for security reason, we can't, you know, use mandarins. You know, this kind of thing are very frustrating. So that's why we really think that we have to have women in power women in parliament, where they can plan, where they can control not only our government, but also international donors having agreement with our government. So it's really important. That's the only way that we will be heard and that Haiti will be really rebuilt as a nation. Emily? I think there are so many good points that have been made and, and some really great questions. And, uh, you know, the, obviously the point that we really bring to it is looking at how can we better hear the voices on the ground and, and the role that technology does indeed play, um, I guess, to the question of is digital democracy actually elitist because of how little access there might be. Um, that was about cameras specifically. Um, yeah, most people don't use cameras, they don't have cameras floating around. The grassroots groups that we work with have chosen to invest their very small amount of money in cameras now that they've seen the power of them. Um, but cameras are one thing, mobile phones are another. Basic mobile phones cost about 12 US dollars in Haiti and people have them. And they might not have electricity, but they go to the charging station outside the camp and they charge them. Um, they might not always have credit, which is why having a free hotline is so important. But they do have, they do have phones and they do use them. Um, a study right after the earthquake showed that um, more than 70% of men and 67% of women in the Port-au-Prince area had mobile phones themselves, which means that pretty much everybody has access to one because they live with somebody who has one or their next door neighbor does, so in emergency situations. And that's what we're really excited by is the opportunities that low cost technologies provide to actually reach so many more people than before. And it gets into that question of monitoring and evaluation. Um, and it gets into the question of even non-traditional donors. And how can you really understand whether or not your work is impacting people on the ground? 
Well, you get in communication with them and you ask. We facilitated Skype conversations between Creole-speaking Haitian women with live translation and folks in the United States at universities, at, um, at corporations, um, at halls of power. Um, and every time that you know real live Haitian women come and speak to a room, it's so wonderful and so glorious. But the thing is, Haitian, like Haitians who are based in Haiti, they don't really like to travel to the United States that much. It's cold here, they miss their food, they miss their culture. I'm not speaking necessarily for you, but I'm speaking for the women we've worked with. Um, and they, they would much prefer to be able to speak to somebody on video and talk to them than always have to go someplace. Um, and so I think it's really about using a variety of tools to really try to hear from people directly and not put all the pressure on one or two voices and the voices that speak English, um, but really to try to use lots of different tools. So one thing I didn't mention is that the blog that the women we work with, right, it's in Creole, but we translate it and we get, and we're working with volunteers and Haitian diaspora to translate it into English so it can reach that wider audience. Um, the tweets that they post on Twitter are in Creole and then they get translated into English. And by doing that, we're actually, they're expressing themselves in their own vision. You, know, you may have noticed all of the photographs are titled with their Creole title, but then also in English so that we, the international audience, can understand it. Um, so just one kind of two quick things on the issue of monitoring and evaluation. I think there's a lot of opportunities for more real-time monitoring and evaluation rather than just, you know, asking generic questions at the end of something to, to find out. And real-time can happen by checking in, by sending SMS, um, by, uh, you know, by really following up with people. Um, and then, you know, the, the question about the solar cook stoves, I don't think any of us are really experts on that, but what I'll say, and I think it really echoes what's already been said, is that Haitian women are very entrepreneurial. So if you want to make anything work, whether it's a cook stove or anything else, like it needs to really be driven by, um, I think, market-based solutions, which again goes back to the mobile phones. It was a market base, the market actually brought mobile phones to Haiti, and people bought them and are using them and making their lives better. So, um, so we really need to look at what are the tools that people can have, giving to people access to tools and skills, and then they will make their own reality with them. Thank you, I am uh, being given the time signal here, and I hate to cut off such a vital and interesting conversation, which says to me, I think we have to make a promise to the future here, be a part of your March program, because there are people here who want to engage in dialogue. And if we can figure out a way that we can continue this conversation in the way forward with Bob and Bob's help and others here today, um, I'm going to turn the panel back over to Bob Perito. But thank you all, and if we could have a round of applause for what I think are fabulous. I'd like, to, I'd like to thank everyone in the audience for coming this morning and for staying with us. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank our visitors from Haiti. Um, and a round of applause for them as well. <laughs>